Welcome to a conversation with a community leader sponsored by Leadership Kits App. And I'm Kerry Bozeman, the host, and I'm the former mayor of Bellevue, Washington and Bremerton, Washington. And my guest today is Kristen Tollison. Did I pronounce that right, Kristen? Yes, that's right. Thanks. Uh, uh, Kristen, you have quite a title. You are the Director of Education and Diversity, Equity and in Inclusion Advancement at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. Is that correct? That's true. Yes, that's uh, true. How long have you been there, Kristen? I've been at the Art Museum since before it opened in 2013. Um, I'm the original education director, so it's going on eight years now. Well, uh, good for you. <laughs> before we get into the Art Museum and a lot of that, uh, the program side of everything, uh, where are you from? What's your background? What brought you to Bainbridge Island? Okay. Uh, well, I, I have spent more than half my life on Bainbridge. I, my oh. folks moved here in the mid seventies. And um, so I grew up the most- from of where, my, Where'd they move from? From Seattle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I've, I've spent most of my life here. I did go away to college and graduate school in the Midwest and I- Or about? Uh, I went to Carleton College in Minnesota. And we have a daughter that went to Middlebury. Yeah, the, um, it's, you know, it's that time of life when you feel like the world is big and you want to take a big chomp of it. So I spent time in Minnesota and then went to graduate school at Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan, which um, where I studied metalsmithing and uh, got a Fulbright to go and live in Iceland where I spent a year in the early 90s and subsequently moved to Rhode Island for a few years where um, my then husband was teaching at Rhode Island School of Design and I worked in museums and um, as an artist there. And then we moved back to Seattle um, and he took a job at the University of Washington and I started working at Pratt Fine Arts Center in Seattle as their education director. Um, had a couple of kids and um, pursued oh. my, oh, they, oh. Are, um, they are grown now, uh, oh. almost 23 year old and a 20 year old. You don't look old enough to have a grown kids, Christine. <laughs> did you go to Bainbridge High School? I did, yeah. yeah. All right. When did you know that you loved art? Did you start painting at a really early age or? Yeah, I was always really creative. We were both, my sister and I were encouraged to be creative with writing and reading and making art. My mom is a painter and an accomplished seamstress. And my dad is a, a really talented and beautiful writer as well. And so they were always supportive of our choices along the way. I, I didn't come to actually making art professionally um, straight through college. I was an art history and anthropology major and I kind of deferred, deferred the art route for a little bit, but it keeps coming back. I'm still a practicing artist. Well, that's interesting. So how did you, uh, let's finish this story off. How did you end up getting it to be, how did you end up getting the job at the Bainbridge Museum, Bainbridge Art Museum? Uh, well, all through my career, I have um, woven together the art making and the education pieces and have ended up working at either nonprofits like Pratt or museums because um, I really believe in this kind of informal education approach to um, learning and sharing art with people. So um, right before I took the job at BIMA, I was working as a teaching artist. Is that what, it, is that what people call it, BIMA? We, for short, yeah, Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. We call it affectionately BIMA. Okay, I got it. <laughs> uh, so I was teaching um, foundations classes at Cornish College of the Arts and um, supporting myself doing art public art commissions um, and also continuing to teach and learn about teaching. And so it was kind of a logical outgrowth of that, that um, the job came open. My kids were both still in high school. 
it was a great opportunity for me to um, work with the startup essentially, which is what oh. the museum was. There are all kinds of museums around the world. They're all different. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the role or the mission of the Bainbridge Art Museum? Well, our, our foundation is one in which we're really based in the region. We're not trying to be a museum that is a global art museum. I know a lot of kids upon first hearing that they're coming to the museum for a field trip will say, well, do you have any, do you have any Picassos? And um, we're oh. really proud to showcase the work of Puget Sound region artists and craftspeople and so, um, and it's also, uh, I would say that access, um, we're free of charge and open seven days a week. That part has also been a really important piece of what makes us unique. So we're really, we're very local and very invested in um, trying to grow our relationship with, with our surrounding community. What's your role at the museum? Kristen, what do you do? Um, well, as education director, I am responsible for a number of public programs. We, I, I really like to help people understand that education is not just about kids and school programs, but it's kind of a, um, you know, full spectrum age range. So we do do school programs and we specialize in reaching up to about Port Angeles, Port Townsend area down to Belfair. And we bring kids or in times when we're able to bring kids to the museum, we're bringing kids for field trips and we're also bringing teaching artists or artists into the classrooms to do or that. The, um, are the school districts busing the kids to the museum? The museum subsidizes the buses. So yes, they are, they're coming on school buses that the museum covers and um, you know, we're constantly- is there, a, is there a general age group you work with on these kind of programs? Primarily K through five, but we, but as I was saying, we do work with high school students. Um, Bainbridge High School students are able to walk down with their classes to the museum. We're that, we're that close. We've worked with college students. We host a variety of internships for graduate students. And then we offer workshops for adults, lectures, film series. And we also have a creative aging program, which started out working with- Creative what? Creative aging. Oh. Um, so began um, in collaboration with the Fry Art Museum, focusing on adults with early stage memory loss and oh. has, has grown into a, a broader program. So oh. how uh, so you got all these programs going on, a lot of them around you. Uh, how has COVID this year changed everything in your world uh, at, it's, the, at the yeah. museum? It has changed everything, that's for sure. We, um, I'm really lucky that I work with a small team in my department and who are versed in technical, um, you know, like do-it-yourself technical use of computers and um, different kinds of software that are available just on regular computers. So we, we actually took a lot of our programs and started filming ourselves doing projects at home and putting those little videos online through our Art in Action program. And they were designed originally to be for people who would drop into the museum. We had these every, every weekend. But then we started launching these videos every week on our website and we would do some sort of activity that was very short and direct and really drew on materials that people might have around the house. Are you getting good response to that? Are people signing up? We are, they don't even have to sign up. Now the, oh. the videos live in kind of a library on our YouTube channel so you can anytime if you would like to learn how to make uh, fold an envelope out of recycled paper or make a clay animal you can um, find out how to do that on our website you get a lot of seniors who are retired all been the in some of the programs we do and um, during the programs in person 
we actually do a lot of work with retired teachers and volunteers who help support our programs as well. Yeah, that's great. Uh, let's talk about the, the very the diversity of our community. We're a very diverse community, like most places in the Northwest. You know, we have Native Americans and we have Filipino community and we have African American community, and it goes on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you how do you how do you relate to all those various communities in, in terms of uh, programs that would relate to those that diversity that we have in this county? We are, so as an art museum, the first contact that people have is really a visual contact. So in our curatorial programming and the education, education supports what's actually being seen in the galleries, we really strive to represent a diversity of cultures so that people who come to the museum can see themselves reflected in that work. Um, that's extended out into programs that we've offered. We have done an annual MLK celebration in conjunction with the community. In the past, we've done Black History Month, um, which gets tied in with MLK celebration. We have offered a Dia de los Muertos celebration um, to the community as well. And I would say that we, I mean, really actively um, are open. We had a, a lovely exhibition called Native Hands, which featured a lot of work, both historic and contemporary work of native artists from around the Salish Sea area. Uh, but I, I will say, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, finish. Uh, I was just gonna say um, all of those efforts really can stand to be, we're in the process of all the time deepening and, and broadening the connections that we have with communities and making space for people to um, come and tell us what they need. So it's not really, we're not sitting in a place where we're, we have an agenda and we're dictating that agenda out. We're really making an effort to open ourselves. I know that uh, Bainbridge Island's had a long history with the Japanese community. There's mm -hmm. a wonderful outdoor, uh, what's the name of that outdoor display? The uh, Bainbridge Island Exclusion Memorial? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, do you do, uh, are the, is the, I assume the Japanese community is still pretty active and involved with the museum? Yes, every, um, again, we've partnered with um, BIJAC, which is the Bainbridge Island Japanese American community in years past to be the, the location for the day of remembrance um, that happens at the end of March. Um, but again, these, you know, these one-off celebratory moments really are all strung together through the year with other kinds of exhibits and conversations that are happening all the time. So, yeah. There are other, uh, this is a side question. Mm -hmm. are there, there, there's, there's a museum, there's an art museum in downtown Bremerton. That's yeah. not a museum. It's an art gallery or something. The gallery, are, there, yeah. are there other museums around Kitsap County? We are the only art museum that I am aware of in Kitsap, but there's the Jefferson County Historical Society, which also shows, um, they have an art portion of what they do up there. Um, so- well, they have a lot of history. They do, yeah, they do. Um, so- but You're the we, only art museum in Kitsap County, huh? We are the only art museum that is strictly art and craft. I mean, there are different smaller focal museums. Um, I know the Val Val Valentinetti Puppet Museum and the Naval Undersea Warfare Museum. Uh, are you, are you, uh, museum's closed right now, right? Are you closed? The museum is closed right now, but our museum store is open um, under current state um, permits. We are, the store is open. Um, so in regular times, though, when you're open and doing business, mm -hmm. I mean, you're open seven, six days a week normally? We're open seven days a week. Yep, seven 10 to 5. Wow. Yeah. So you, you don't charge admission to come into the museum. Right. Is that correct? No. So how do you fund the, the exhibitions and the programs and all that kind of thing? How do you fund all that? We 
actively fundraise all year long and um, do that in a variety of ways through grant writing, which I am engaged with and a variety of other staff also help with. We have a development department that is that thinks about this way more strategically in terms of um, an annual fundraiser this year, our auction, which is normally an in-person person dinner and auction event was moved online and um, turned into a bash in a box, which was a dinner delivered to people who were attending the auction and participated in the raise the paddle. And then we also had an online art sale and auction that happened at the beginning of October. And um, both were really well received. We, the advantage is that you can have somebody attend from Philadelphia who uh, wouldn't be able to come in person, <laughs> for example. Well, there's another advantage. I'm, a, I'm aware of two or three uh, big major fundraisers for nonprofits, one's a Humane Society where I've been right. on their board for a long time. And, uh, you know, they've all done this online thing this year because you can't have big groups meeting and going to auctions and they've all done pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me where, you know, we were all worried about it and I don't think they've raised the same amount as they raised when people were there in person, mm -hmm. but pretty good. Yeah. So people are really reacting and trying to, and in some cases, and I'm one of those sometimes I say my wife, Thank gosh, we don't have to go to the event. We just send a check in this year. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Well, and the, the passion runs deep for all those nonprofits, including the art museum, that people are people feel connected and it's about helping them feel connected even when they're not connected in, in physical space. So the 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 Bainbridge Art Museum is a nonprofit mm -hmm. with a board of directors. Yes. And you have an annual budget. About what is your annual budget approximately? Uh, it's over a million dollars for sure. Okay. <laughs> and so the board of directors and you, I'm, I would imagine you've got a ton of volunteers that help you do this fundraising work, right? We do. And actually our staff is really, they're very, very, very together on it. So, yeah. Does, uh, does the museum have an endowment? Uh, we don't yet. That's something that is um, something that's been discussed and will be, I'm sure, acted upon in the future. But at this point, we don't. You know, especially for museums and things. I worked for the Boys and Girls Club of America for 30 years, in one of my prior lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've done a lot of fundraising. Mm -hmm. But there are organizations that endowments really work well for, and I would guess yours would be one of them. Yeah. Where people leave you money in their estate, or mm -hmm. they leave you property, or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would I would suggest that, you, and I know you're already doing this, but you guys take a good look at that. That's yeah. my one that's my one fundraising suggestion for the day. Okay, I'll pass um, it along. <laughs> so you've got a million dollar budget. How big a staff do you have and who are they? What do they do? Oh, uh, so. I don't need have... to know the individual <laughs> names, just the titles. Or you we can mention a... them if you want. Well, I'll start with our, our senior staff. We have an executive director, Sheila Hughes. We have a um, head curator, Greg Robinson, who was our, also has. So how many, how, before that. How many yeah. staff do you have? Um, you know, we have a we have a lot of full and part time combined. But we have you're asking a really difficult question. I need to I should have brought my cheat sheet. Well, just guess how many full time. We, how many? Eight? We have probably about fifteen full time staff. Wow. Yeah. That's um, staff. Yeah. That's uh, I bet it, I bet it's just the best place in the world to work. It's a great place to work, yeah. And yeah. Um, we, because we are a tight knit group, we are always trying to find new and better ways of working together, for sure. Yeah. Do you do much in the with the Seattle Art Museum or some of those? Do you have do you have a relationship with those folks? We, yeah. I mean, the sub community of art museums is very tightly knit and so we we do work I, we don't exhibit 
you know, they're totally different scales of work and also different focuses of work. They have a lot of art coming from, um, loaned from outside of the state and their, their mission is more, um, you know, global exhibition. Mm -hmm. But we have borrowed work from them for our exhibitions. And a great example of working together is Barbara Earl Thomas, who had a solo show with us and now has a solo show at the Seattle Art Museum. Um, so it's the, there is an inevitable crossover with local artists. Seattle's art scene is vibrant and also, you know, not it's not huge. So yeah, and struggling financially right now, mm. as everybody else is. Mm -hmm. um, do you feature local artists? I'm, I assume you do. Yes, our focus is on artists from between the Cascades and the Olympics, really. So local, definitely to the region, the Puget Sound region. Uh -huh. So I've been in your building a couple of times. It's a wonderful building, uh, beautiful. And I'm forgetting the architect's name to give him credit. Matthew uh, Coates. Yeah. Matthew Coates, who I'm, I'm working with on another project down in Aberdeen. I'm trying to help that community build a building similar to the one that you have. Mm -hmm. um, so I, do you, my question is, do you lease out space or let, uh, let organizations come in and use the space for special events and that sort of thing? Uh, we do, again, um, not at the moment, but we do. Oh, but normally. But yes, we've had um, everything from weddings to um, conferences to job fairs. Um, so depending on the group and depending on their configuration, we've had them in our auditorium or in the galleries. How big is your auditorium? Uh, it seats 104 people. Wow, that's great. It's a very, it's intimate, but it's, but it's, yeah, that's uh, a good number. I'm assuming you've charged charge fees for this so you can raise money for the museum. Is that correct? Yeah, there's a, a rental system. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, that, that's a, so I want to uh, go back to the building again. Uh, that's a major capital uh, challenge, building a building like that. Uh, how much money, approximately, how much money did it cost to build it and how did you raise it? Oh, that was, that actually predated my arrival at the museum. Um, it was a vision of Cynthia Sears, who is um, our very founding mother, really, uh, to have. You know, it, all, it, it usually <laughs> is somebody that had this vision that would, it would be able to bring people together around the idea and the vision and the leadership, to make it, yeah. make it happen. That's. That's how these projects happen. Well, it really, it really was a vision for what was on that site before the museum. But it was a, a pre, it was a World War II building that was then had a big parking lot behind it. And uh, right. apparently a big cache of tires buried underground and a school bus even that was excavated. So um, the, that was the vision to have this kind of living room for the arts. So this welcoming space that was poised at the intersection coming off the ferry and the one that went through Winslow. Well, Kristen, you're an artist. What's your favorite work you've done and what, what is the favorite area you love to work in just on a personal basis? Uh, well, I, I really love working um, sculpturally and I also love making jewelry. I, I kind of see those as two parts of the same thing. One is smaller and one is larger, but um, I, let's see, my favorite, I'm gonna just say what some of my favorite artwork is. And um, I'm really a big fan of Ruth Asawa, who is a um, metal artist from the Bay Area who does some beautiful woven wire work that was featured on some postage stamps earlier this summer. So. Do you have a project that you've done yourself that you particularly love? I, I am currently working on a project for the Port of Seattle that I've been working on for the past eight years that is a habitat restoration and public access site down in South Park in Seattle. And um, I would say that's one of my favorite projects. It's been going on much longer than a public art project typically does. But yeah. in the process, I've gotten to know folks in what, the community. What do you think of Sculpture Park? 
Oh, I love it. I love, yeah. yeah. Ride my bike through there all the time. It's kind of a little bit out of the way. Uh, oh. you know, I wish it was somewhere else and I hope they do something really great on that waterfront. Seattle yeah. does not have like a central park, uh, no. a, a public space in the middle of the city. Right. Like we did, we built when I was in Bellevue or central park in New York. And mm -hmm. um, so I've always wished that sculpture park was someplace else. This, Kristen, the title of this program is a conversation with a community leader. And you're a community leader. You affect lots of people's lives. You have a kind of a philosophy about leadership or how you lead your life or anything like that you want to share with us? Oh, absolutely. I um, really being candid and honest and curious about what people what makes people tick? I think it's easy to come at things thinking that you know the right answer, but it's very humbling and informative to just become a good listener. So yeah. I think that I've always thought listening was the most underrated uh, skill. If I, if you and I went to lunch or somebody else, my goal would be to know more about you than I knew when I came in. Right. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And to listen to everything you had to say, because, you know, why do I need to talk? I already know everything I know. So uh -huh. I think listening is just on And when I go most of my life, and I've been in public office and all these jobs, I find very few people. And the key to being a good listener is to be able to ask good questions. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Be a good question asker. So is there anything, Chris, and we're about ready to wrap up. I know the director is going to be mad at me. Uh, that I haven't asked you about the museum that you'd like to share real quickly? Well, I will just say that um, the museum is, we're so fortunate to have the museum and we're so fortunate that we've been able to stay as buoyant as we have during this time. We're just making strides in reaching out in all different ways. We just served 150 um, Thanksgiving meals to folks in need through the uh, island volunteer caregivers. And so we're, we're just really trying to be responsive. I think that that's, I'm very proud to work there. Well, you're one of the people that I, I admire, people that are working their, working their, their vision, working their passion. And yes, you get paid for it, but what a wonderful opportunity to go to work every day and love what you do. But not only that, to be making life better for people. So mm. you're doing that, Kristen. And I uh, appreciate having a conversation with you. I've enjoyed it very much. I wish it could have been longer, but stay well, stay safe. We're gonna all get through this and uh, talk to you next time. Okay, Thanks, thanks so much for having me. Nice to, nice to have the conversation. Leadership Kitsap is our community's civic leadership program. Leadership Kitsap fosters and empowers educated, prepared, and engaged community leaders. For over 25 years, we have cultivated leaders that work collaboratively to create positive change, dedicated to making our community a better place to work and live. We expose our class to Kitsap's leaders across public, private, and nonprofit sectors. We are happy to bring many of the conversations with these leaders to you. Strong leaders build strong communities.